please go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning. We thank you for your love for us. But most importantly, we as a body of believers, the church, your bride, whom you are preparing to come and take. Lord, as we study this, Lord, I pray that we shall understand it with the honest uh, understanding the way you wanted it to be understood, the way you wanted us to know it, that the Lord we shall know it without exemptions, and that the Lord Jesus will be able to abide in your word. And as we grow as the local church, and as we grow as the body of Christ, we will be one and be able to remain in your word and serve you for the glory of your name and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, Charles, uh, for leading us in that uh, word of prayer. Uh, we will continue uh, with our publication here uh, on the house of God. And in the last class, you know, we took time to uh, learn about the church being the pillar of truth and you know there were so many questions that we had so uh, you know, we kind of dwelt on that uh, and today we will move forward we will touch on chapter 12 which is about the local church as the bride of Christ so what is it that we can learn uh, uh, you know about the way God deals with the church and as ministers of God, how does that affect the ministry that we engage in? So that is the perspective with which we are going to study about the church being the bride of Christ. Uh, now, uh, among all the pictures, you know, so far we've seen uh, the church being the, the body of Christ, the family of God, uh, the army and uh, the pillar of truth. Uh, among all these, and we will touch on a few more pictures as well, uh, we could say that, you know, probably this is one of the most wonderful pictures of the church being the bride of Christ. And where do we get this idea of the church being the bride of Christ? As we look at the old covenant uh, and also God's dealings uh, with the church in the new covenant, we see that, you know, God has a way of dealing with his people. And that is a, that is a way of grace. Uh, so we, we observe that, uh, you know, God, the, and we look at certain scriptures also where um, God himself addresses the church as his bride. So that's where we get this understanding from. Now, some of the differences in the old covenant and the new covenant that we observe is that in the old covenant, things were based on the law. Okay? But in the new covenant, things are, uh, things are, uh, of course, it's not that Jesus wanted to dismiss the law, but uh, grace is something that is introduced in the new covenant. And under the old covenant, we observe that there were only some people who could experience the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. But under the new covenant, you know, the Holy Spirit indwells every believer and the Holy Spirit can empower every believer. It's not just, you know, a certain select uh, people who are called for special works, but every believer can experience the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So these are the differences, but the common or the similar similarities that we observe in both the covenants is that God treats his people as the chosen people. And these chosen people are supposed to be a blessing to all the nations. So we are called to all the nations. We are called to bring many people to the kingdom uh, of God and uh, lead them into experiencing the love of Jesus Christ. So that is something. We are a chosen people in the old covenant as well as in the new covenant. And we as God's people, we're also known as the royal priesthood or people who can minister to God. Okay. People who can minister to God. And as I've been saying, you know, the way God deals with the church is it's very, uh, uh, very tender and filled with love. Uh, and, you know, God calls the church his bride. So let's look at, you know, a couple of uh, uh, Old Testament 
instances where the church is called as the bride. In fact, we find that uh, prophets like Jeremiah, Hosea, and Isaiah, they have prophesied, and there are quite a few scriptures where, uh, you know, the conversation is as if God is speaking to his bride. So in Jeremiah 2, verses 2 to 3, uh, again, can somebody please read this passage? It is on page 79, page 79 of our notes. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. Yeah. Yes. Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, This is the Lord. I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase, all that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. So uh, we see the word betrothal there. Okay. And, uh, God talks about Israel or his own people, his chosen people, being betrothed to him. Now, betrothed is um, engagement. Uh, and, you know, the uh, in certain cultures, they use the term betrothal. And, and you know, there are um, uh, some guidelines that kind of come with that. But bet betrothal is in the Jewish culture. So what God is essentially saying is that the relationship of his people Israel uh, with him was uh, such as betrothal. So, you know, he talks about the kindness, the love, the demonstration of uh, Israel's pursuit of God uh, and the fact that, you know, the, the nation was like a holy nation dedicated unto God. And it was like a relationship of betrothal. Uh, and even later, you know, we, we know that Jeremiah is, is the weeping prophet who prophesied to call a wayward people back to God. So even when uh, the, the people of Israel backslided, you know, they, they had this commitment with God, but they went their own ways. You know, they uh, did not keep themselves for, for God. Even at that time, you know, God was not someone who chose to abandon them. So there are, uh, uh, there are uh, words of prophecy over the children of Israel, which say that, you know, I will bring you back. So Jeremiah 3.14, where God says, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. So it's as if, you know, God is being merciful. God is being um, uh, long suffering in the face of Israel's betrayal and waywardness. So, you know, God calls his people back and he uses the term married, which is to uh, demonstrate his commitment. You know, we talk about God's covenant with us. Covenant is um, uh, the promise of God, which cannot be broken, right? Because he is true and he has made that commitment with us. So God is uh, talking about how he treated his people with such kindness and mercy, even at a time when they went away from God. And that is the kind of commitment that God has towards his people. Now, there are uh, several other passages. I won't be able to read every passage uh, which is given in our notes, but I would encourage us to you know, go back and um, read it. Maybe I'll read one uh, passage here from Jeremiah 31. Uh, verses 3 and 4, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt. O virgin of Israel, you shall again be adorned with your tambourines and shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. So uh, God is revealing himself as a restorer and his promise of love to his people uh, is is one of uh, you know one that will last so we see that he's promising his everlasting love to his people 
Okay, and uh, he kind of draws. He kind of draws back even the wayward children of Israel. when they had gone their own ways it's as if you know uh, he is drawing back uh, his bride to himself with the promise of rebuilding and restoration so that's the kind of attitude that's what god demonstrates you know as uh, 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 he he also uses the word uh, husband you shall call me uh, your husband so we see that, that in the book of hosea where uh, god says to his children and it shall be in that day says the lord that you shall you will call me my husband and no longer me my master for i will take from your mouth the names of the bales and they shall be remembered by their name no more so basically you know uh, this is uh, uh, emulating one of the the most beautiful relationships that you know we can see uh, in mankind which is the the relationship between a husband and a wife and uh, god is providing that kind of a commitment to the church so what comes out of this we just read the passage from hosea where god says okay you shall call me my husband so as we look at you know the the uh, way he is relating to his people so here are some things that that we can understand what god does is he calls his people his forever now you are mine forever so you see that in in a marriage relationship it's a covenant between a man and a woman um, you know in the um, with god at the center of it so uh, we see here in the same manner where uh, that this covenant or this commitment between a man and a wife is is a lasting covenant lasts as long as their lifetime but we know that we serve an everlasting god so when god makes a commitment with his people what he is saying is so he is saying that my commitment towards you is for ever and you are mine forever and so we see that uh, god in this relationship is drawing his people to himself in righteousness so what is it based on the relationship is based on righteousness it's based on holiness it's based on purity okay which uh, which which kind of stems from god but you know that marks the relationship uh, between god and his people now we also find that you know god uh, uh, is one who grants that commitment and you know one of protection so he promises his people justice i haven't read all the scriptures from where i'm uh, you know making these points but i encourage us to please go back and read those verses so you know he promises justice to his people uh, so through that to every form of oppression injustice whatever we may be facing so we can uh, we can always see god for his deliverance upon our lives god extends his loving kindness and we just saw the kind of uh, love that he promises to us it is an everlasting love god grants his mercy so you know uh, israel was wavered we talked about it so they were the people who experienced failures but in the midst of those failures in the midst of the weaknesses which they carried you know god is a god who extended his mercy and said okay fine you know i am i am great and i choose to forgive you i choose to continue to lead you so he extends his mercy towards his people and you know in the commitment in uh, the marriage uh, relationship we understand that you know it's about faithfulness okay uh, his faith it's about faithful love so god is committing that faithful love to the church and he's saying that you know i i will continue to to carry you i will continue to be there for you and that's the kind of love that he extends towards his people and of course you know god promises intimacy meaning uh the opportunity for us to know him in a deeper way for us to know him in a uh a greater manner so now god promises this kind of a relationship with his people and assuring uh his people that you know um, again you know there are passages that we can look at uh, we looked at some passages from jeremiah we looked at some from hosea now if we touch upon some passages from 
Isaiah, there again, you know, the prophet prophesies to tell God's people that they are God's beloved. And again, you know, the, uh, God speaks over them and he says, for your maker is your husband. Okay, So God is the one who's proposing this kind of a uh, commitment to his people. And, you know, we're able to understand even when we look at the New Testament, the passage about uh, husbands and wives and how they are meant to relate to one another in Ephesians chapter 5. You know, we, we see that you know, there is that entire description, husbands love your wives and all of that. But later, Paul adds and he says, but I, I'm talking about Christ and his church. So uh, God and the church you know, uh, is, is that primary example uh, from where we can learn you know, what this, this entire relationship is all about. So you know, God terms himself in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5. He says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and your redeemer is the holy one of Israel. So again, you know, God is, is basically promising his unending love and faithfulness towards his people uh, and we continue to see Isaiah 62 you know where uh, it's like a bridegroom rejoicing over his bride you no know, oh, this is what the passage says I will read it for us from verses 4 to 7 I'm on page 80 in our notes you shall no longer be termed forsaken nor shall your land any more be termed desolate but you shall be called Hepzibah and your land Beulah for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So, you know, in God's uh, calculation, we find that, you know, uh, the church is not a burden for God. You know, it's not a project. Uh, it's not uh, uh, something that God is trying to drag you know, with him and think that I have to extend my mercy to these people. I have to be kind to them. Uh, they are always going away from me. Uh, and, you know, they, uh, they are so stiff necked. That's not the kind of response that God has towards his people. Okay. We can see very clearly you know, the terms that are used here. God speaks to his people and he says, you are Hepzibah, meaning you are my delight. Okay, that's translated uh, from uh, the Hebrew. It means delight. So God's people are his delight. It's never a task or it's never a chore for him to be ministering to his people, to be um, you know, taking care of his people, uh, to be uh, there for his people. God delights. God delights in loving his people. And Beulah means marriage. Again, you know, that picture of uh, commitment, that picture of God's everlasting faithful love towards his people, God's mercy, right? All of that comes into play. So how does God relate to the church? You know, we understand that God has this, this uh, love welling up in him, which is overflowing, you know, which is poured out on his church the bride so god delights in his people now when we understand this you know, how does it really matter to us you know, one of the reasons why we must know uh, about this relationship that god has with the church is because when we serve people you now we are all talking about being kingdom builders and especially in this um, uh, course we are talking about the church and dealing with the church and building the church and relating with the church as ministers of God. Now, we may all not be positioned as pastors, but in our own capacity, we must realize that we are not here to uh, force a people to follow a set of rules. No, that's not what we are doing. But here is a, a, a chosen people, God's own people in whom he delights. And so you know, when we are ministering to God's people, our attitude, our attitude in the way we serve his people you know, has to be right. And this truth of understanding uh, the fact that the people of God are his bride, they are the delight of God, you know, it helps us value people in that way. Okay? We um, 
don't uh, kind of you know lord over them or boss over them or uh, misuse our authority over them because we understand god uh, uh, finds these people you know precious and he has showered his love upon them and we are here uh, just to aid you know in in that uh, loving work that god is extending over the lives of his people so we look at god's people as his delight as his bride and as a people over whom the lord rejoices so we as ministers of god must also rejoice over god's people and the attitude with which we serve them must be um, a loving attitude okay so let's see what else we can uh, understand and what else we can learn from uh, god's relating to the church you know uh, as as a bridegroom now there are uh, other passages as well that we will look at um, we see that you know there is the parable of the 10 virgins okay the 10 virgins so what can we get out of that parable this is in matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13 here jesus gives the illustration of jewish wedding and we know that a jewish wedding, uh, unlike you know weddings in other parts of the world it extended over several days so you know there was there was a uh, um, there was a wait for the groom to come and during that time the bride and the uh, friends of of the bride needed to get themselves ready so jesus used this parable to teach us about preparedness about readiness about expectation right about endurance because you know, we know that the bridegroom is going to return okay and jesus used this illustration to tell us that he is going to come back the church is supposed to be waiting for the return of jesus christ so uh when we look at the church right we talked about so many different aspects we said that the church is like a, a, the church is the family of god so based on that you know we relate to one another with brotherly love we carry one another's burdens uh, we serve one another we um you know uh, all of that so that's how it, it kind of uh, in practicality it's it is seen in the church so now that we are the bride of christ and we are awaiting the return of the lord jesus christ how should the church be in other words how should every believer be in the church eagerly awaiting eagerly awaiting the return of christ now if the believers are not eagerly awaiting the return of the bridegroom something is wrong in the way we understand you know our god the way we understand um the second coming the way we understand our preparation for the second coming now if you look at the early church uh, they did not they did not realize that you know it would take 2000 plus years for christ to return so when you read the epistles when you read the um, apostles writing to the churches you know they were very earnest uh, and they they always wrote things like you know be ready uh Christ is coming so the first century church they trusted and believed that Christ would return they didn't know the time but they lived as if it's now it's you know it's it's right away so uh that eagerness right even when paul wrote to the thessalonians that's how he writes and he says come on you need to have an earnest um earnest expectation and be uh, joyfully ready for the return of the right group so that teaches us that we must impart the truth to the body of christ and we we must see the body of christ waiting upon the bridegroom god in that manner you know if if i waiting for the bridegroom god is like yeah okay he's coming you know we've missed it we've really missed it but you know if we are expectant and joyful the way the 10 virgins you know we see those 10 virgins among them five of them they were eagerly waiting with uh, the oil meaning they had some level of preparation uh, in their lives and they were expecting any time the bridegroom is going to come so the church is supposed to be like that okay and that is how we have to uh, groom or we must we must impart the truth to the church now let's look at a you know, couple of other aspects a chaste virgin okay so when paul uh, writes to the corinthians you know he is very he is very uh, zealous for the 
church and he makes a statement second corinthians 11 2 he says for i am jealous for you with godly jealousy for i have betrothed you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ okay so what is he saying basically he's he's saying that the church must be protected and preserved the way uh, paul had served the church and he had invested you know in the body of believers and at that time we know that you know there were uh, so many other temptations erroneous teachings that were going on uh, uh, you know false prophets were around uh, so paul is is very protective of the church in that way okay? now he's not trying to be controlling but what he's saying is the work which has been done in all of you you know it was his desire to make sure that the people don't lose it and even when christ returns you know he wanted to see the people cha- chaste virgin meaning you know it, it's it's talking about uh, somebody who is committed and who's waiting uh, for uh, her groom so in that manner you know, the church is waiting only for her groom which is the lord jesus christ so uh, we as god's god's uh, ministers we see here that paul he takes his position as the friend of the groom okay uh, and he says who is the bridegroom he says i have betrothed you to one husband which obviously you know it is the lord jesus christ so we are he prepared the bride okay paul prepared the bride and we know that you know everyone uh, the responsibility of the ministers of god is to prepare the bride as one chaste bride for the bridegroom who is returning so that's what our ministry uh, should bring about okay? we are preparing the bride for the return of, of christ and we also see that the bride uh, is the church okay and uh, the church or god's people now what kind of a bride is the lord jesus going to return for so the passage in ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 to 32 that's a, a, a very good description of the kind of bride that the lord jesus is going to return for so i'm not going to read the entire passage here but we see that you know he is coming back for a glorious okay a glorious church he is coming back for a church without blemish um, a, a church which is perfect in holiness okay so that is the expectation now when we talk about you know the preparation for the return of christ what kind of preparation is required of course our intimacy with god uh, is something that matters okay intimacy of the church as a body and every believer individually their intimacy with god uh, is important but at the same time you know the preparation uh, in terms of holiness in terms of you know uh, the terms that are used is without blemish and that simply means not being tainted by sin okay not being tainted by sin but consecrating ourselves dedicating ourselves unto the lord and being in that position of being dedicated to god but that's the kind of church that the lord jesus is going to return for a church which is pure uh, and you know we we also see that it is a glorious church okay or filled with the glory of god which represents which represents which shines um, the the person of god to the world uh, around it and, and again as ministers of god this is the preparation this is the investment that we are making into the the house of god into the lives of the people of god to prepare them in this manner that every single one of us that we may walk in that kind of glory right uh, releasing that kind of glory to the world around us so we are the glorious church that the lord jesus is going to return for and a blemishless and a holy pure church that he is going to return for and you know what is the kind of um, uh, as part of the relationship um, you know of of a husband and wife there are other things also we see in this passage where god promises the church that he is going to sanctify or in other words cleanse the church so what agent what, what uh, is he going to use to clean the church you know the word of god the word of god 
purifies our hearts okay we we see even jesus talked about it uh in uh, john 17 17 you know, the, where he says like your word is truth and uh, it's the truth right that he uses to cleanse our hearts so how is god going to prepare our hearts and keep it blemishless by washing us with the water which is the word of god and that is why the church should be given uh, and committed to the word of god and again you know, that that is a pointer to us as ministers of god Now, how do we how do we raise up a holy and a pure church a people who are walking right in the ways of god we need the power of the word of god without that we will not be able to prepare the bride for the return of the bride group so we invest in the truth of god's word we speak the truth of god's word over the hearts and the lives of the people and we also see uh, once again you know the way we saw earlier uh, in uh, uh, the book of isaiah where god says that you are my delight okay we see that in this relationship between the husband and the wife what god is saying is that he will he the husband nourishes and cherishes right his wife so in the same manner the lord jesus is committed to the growth and the well being and the fruitfulness of the church okay Uh, which is us which is every single one of us who believe in the lord jesus christ so as ministers of god you know we must understand that we are serving as friends of the bride and you know friends of the groom we are here for the preparation of the bride for the return of the lord jesus christ and that our god delights in his people he delights in his people uh okay some more things that we can look at there is a passage here from uh, revelation 19 verses 6 through 9 um where we see that the bride makes herself ready okay the bride makes herself ready for the return of the groom you know, once again you know what is this readiness which we are talking about we've touched on aspects like holiness we've touched on aspects like intimacy okay uh, but the bride makes herself ready and in this passage uh, in the book of uh, revelation uh, you also find that the bride is arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints so the clothes of the bride are described and we know as we study about who we are in Christ Jesus that through the work of the cross the finished work of the cross every believer has been clothed with righteousness every believer has been justified and made righteous so the garments that we have on as the people of god you know we are washed in the blood of the lamb and our garments are you know bright and clean and just the way it is described here the the attire a fine linen which the bride is wearing for the uh, for the marriage you know in that manner it's a walk of righteousness so here again as ministers of god those who are serving the church it's important for us to help people uh, find the path of righteousness lead them in the path of righteousness because what is the kind of bride that the groom is going to come back for clothed in righteousness right so we can we can have uh, uh, uh the clothes tainted with sin or you know rags uh, as the bridegroom returns uh, and our work as ministers of god must be to make sure that the bride is clothed in garments of righteousness even as the groom returns okay uh, so the readiness the readiness of the bride uh, is important the readiness in the manner in which the the groom expects and we you know seen uh, that his expectation is is that the bride will be chaste that she will um, be holy she will be pure that she will um, have the garments of righteousness on her and also you know be expectant for the groom to return so uh, revelation 22 verse 17 where it says and the spirit and the bride say come the spirit and the bride say come so far we've seen the preparation uh, which can be done 
through the word of God, the cleansing that comes about in the body of Christ. Uh, and we've also, you know, uh, seen how as ministers of God, with the right attitude, we begin to invest, uh, we begin to nurture the body of Christ you know, to prepare herself for the return of the groom. Uh, but here, you know, there are two, two things that we notice. One is the spirit. The spirit says come or the work of the Holy Spirit in the preparation of the bride. Yes, the word is poured on our lives. And so we are being prepared for the return of Christ. But at the same time, you know, the Holy Spirit is at work. So as ministers of God, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in the church, inviting the Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of the believers. It's very important because without his work, you know, the preparation will not be complete. So the spirit, it says, so the Holy Spirit is working in the church, preparing her to say, come or return, Lord Jesus. So there is a preparation of the Holy Spirit. And it also says, the bride says, come. Which means that the bride is desiring for the return of the groom. Okay, it's not like, you know, she's saying, oh, no, it's uh, today is my wedding. You know, I've never heard anybody say things like that. But more so the church, right? Expectant for the return of Christ and awaiting, awaiting uh, joyfully for the return of the bridegroom. So the bride says, come. And again, as I talked about the early church, we, we see that you know, they were expectant and eager for the return of Christ. And they you know, there are instructions that the apostles gave them to, to uh, protect themselves from wrong teachings, to make sure that they hold on to the faith till the end so that they will never stumble. Okay, So in the same manner, each one of us, every believer, you know, we must be expectant for the return of Christ and have that heart that says, okay, God, I want to be ready. I want to be prepared when you come back. So expectation is important. So we kind of tie uh, everything together and, and look at some of the um, takeaways from um, this picture of the church being the bride. So what have we been saying? We've been saying that the bride, you know, it, she's supposed to have uh, an attitude of love towards her groom. So uh, she is lost in love, admiration and commitment to her group. And that shows us as the church, you know, that we maintain that kind of an attitude. And how does that attitude really show in the church? You know, um, we could say that an attitude of worship is, is uh, something that expresses this longing, this waiting, this admiration of our bridegroom, God, our King, right? So uh, our worship unto the Lord. And, you know, as part of our worship, uh, even as, you know, we, we see uh, the days drawing closer to the return of Christ, you know, all around the world, you would find that, you know, the, the kind of songs that are being written, the anointing upon on worship that we observe, you know, people's hearts are being prepared. It's, be, it's being kind of, um, you know, softened uh, towards our bridegroom king. And it's as if the church is crying out and calling out and understanding you know, the, the height, the depth, the width of the love of God for us. And we are responding back with the same kind of love towards our God. So, you know, the, the church must have that kind of a, a loving attitude towards God. But let's say, for example, it's the opposite. What if the church is dry? What if worship is just, yeah, we're singing some songs. Yeah, okay, Jesus is going to come back. You know, we we are not preparing the church as the bride because what 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 do we see in scripture we see that the bridegroom desires the bride and the bride responds right with commitment with admiration with longing for the return of the groom so if the church's heart is not prepared in that manner that we are not longing for our god so something is wrong with um, 
the kind of preparation that we have okay now uh, since we are talking about all these things i i, I guess uh, uh, you know uh, we must not it, uh, you know there are some some pointers over here in the notes which uh, have been given uh, that you know we must whatever we are, are sharing here this is uh, to understand the relationship of god with the church okay so this does not mean that you know it's one or the other for example uh, people who are married you know, it's it would be wrong for them to say that oh okay because god has committed himself as a spouse you know i i am completely given to that relationship with god and my earthly relationship with my spouse doesn't matter any no because what are we what we are doing is we kind of um, um we are giving ourselves to one truth and we are disengaging ourselves from another truth because scripture says you know you must honor uh, marriage marriage is honorable so uh, it's not to say that you know we make our relationship with god the primary thing to discard the human relationship no okay that's that's not what it means uh, and also uh, you know this uh, is not you know meant to be something emotional and uh, all of that but you know you get the point right it's basically to understand the attitude that god has towards the church and the uh, attitude that the church has towards god and as ministers of god you know how should we prepare the church and how should we um serve the church okay a couple of other things that we can glean from this this picture the church being the bride is that you know the bride adorns herself with the best okay for for the wedding day so again we as god's people you know uh, our question should be okay what is it that is going to please our god if righteousness pleases our god then yes we walk in the ways of righteousness so we're constantly asking that question uh you know what is it that will please our god and what is it that he you know causes to be ready at his coming and we just engage ourselves we give ourselves to that to make our bridegroom god our king happy then the bride uh because of this relationship that you know god has um given us as a picture we realize that god is expressing a closeness okay? he is expressing a closeness to the church see uh, god could have used any picture we could have had in our uh, um notes here we could have had you know the boss and his employee right we could have had that picture okay and instead of talking about the bride the employee could have been the picture where well, we talked of okay you know god entrusts us with responsibility with authority with dominion but god has chosen the picture of the bride so what comes along with it you know the closeness that god is expressing with his people and that closeness also um tells us that we are recipients of his unconditional love so you know the way we relate to god with the way uh, jesus for the first time jesus you know when uh, he prayed he taught his disciples to pray he said our father who art in heaven which was a novelty for people of jesus times but you see this is like similar it's kind of mind boggling where god says that you know i am the bridegroom and the church is the bride so what comes along with it we are recipients of god's unconditional love affection gentleness mercy faithfulness justice uh, uh, his enduring love right and so much more and at the same time the closeness also uh, reveals the sharing right the sharing of god's heart so he is willing to reveal the deeper things of his heart to us and that is the work of the church you know what a privilege god's not saying that okay i'll just tell you what to do and that's about it but you know, this relationship of intimacy tells us that we can understand the heart of god we are that close to god as the people of god and so you know, we can know what is it that god wants for our own lives as well as as we you know when we minister to people we can move from the heart of god to bless the lives of the people and we share that kind of closeness with god so, so we have access to god's heart and uh, that 
is what God is trying to tell us. Very close, very close, intimate with the groom. Okay, and uh, again, talking about you know this kind of a relationship, it's quite clear that as God expresses His commitment, He expects that same commitment from the bride. So we as God's people, we have to consecrate. That's where, you know, the dedication, the setting apart comes where we say, okay, God, you know, you have committed yourself and you are giving all of yourself to us. We are giving all of ourselves to you, oh God. And we are committing ourselves only to you. Right? And we've seen examples of people in um, the Bible who have lived like that. You've had people like Daniel and his friends and Joseph, you know, in the midst of oppressing pressures, they were still committed. They said, okay, we will not worship, right? We will not worship any other, um, uh, any other uh, uh, idols or gods, things like that. So our commitment to God must be deep and you know it, it must be something very strong and obviously you know the bride keeps herself for the groom and she does not settle for anyone else so we don't give our commitment to anyone else and um yeah we've touched on all the other points here yeah so uh one one last point here is that every ministry right should flow um with the consideration that the church is the bride. Um, and even, you know, uh, when we intercede, when we intercede and we're praying for the body of Christ, we we know, right, that, that, that God will respond. If this is the kind of closeness he's expressing uh, to the church, he's a God who will respond to our prayers. So uh, just the practical aspects, I'll touch on it. And then, you know, maybe we can take a few questions and close or come back and uh, discuss a little bit before we move on to the next topic. So some practical aspects here. We must awaken the body of believers to be passionate lovers of God and worshippers of God. Okay, And that is the right way to build the church as the bride of Christ. Okay, and we must teach people that whatever ministry is done, it must be birthed out of love for God and it must be birthed out of love for God's people. It shouldn't be done as, you know, oh, okay, just sternly correcting the people or doing it as a duty, doing it as an obligation. No, but, you know, it's, it's from a place of sincere love for God. It's from a place of sincere love for God's people. Uh, and we must understand you know, the kind of love that God has for his people um, and, uh, you know, make sure that we are, our ministry is flowing with that same kind of love. And we must be uh, very sensitive to the moving of the spirit um, and recognize, you know, we talked about intimacy, right? We talked about intimacy. So God relates very closely with us. Even as we minister, you know, we must, Come to that place of hearing God closely, knowing His heart, you know, in a in a um, in a clear way, and through that, serve the way God is calling us to serve, uh, and you know, from His presence, sort of, and that will bless the hearts and the lives of the people. Maybe it's a prophetic word we are releasing, or you know, prophetic songs that are coming through the presence of God uh, or, or different things, you know, the miracles that God is releasing, the healings that God is releasing, but so close to his heart and so close to his presence and it's coming out of that place. Now, uh, what are some of the challenges with the picture of the bride? Uh, you know, it's very nice to receive an invitation from God to come close to him. So the, the invitation says, come, okay? And I'm sure all of us as believers at any given stage in our lives, you know, if you are invited to an entire day of worship, you would, you know, pick that wholeheartedly and say, I don't want to do anything else. I'll just worship, right? And enjoy God's presence. But at the same time, while we are here on the earth, God has given us the great commission. So the great commission says go. While the invitation for us as a bride is to come and, you know, be in the presence of God and enjoy his love for us. God is, it's the same God who says, you go and make disciples of all nations. Right? So the balance, 
the balance. Otherwise, what happens? Believers will just stay in the cum and never step out to serve the Great Commission. So to strike a balance uh, and not to ignore the go. And uh, just because we are going, we are serving, we are striving, we are working hard, it doesn't mean that you know we are, we've lost our intimacy with God. So it's got to be times of being still in his presence, being close to him and going and serving, doing the work that he has called us to do. Um, yeah, so I think that would be kind of the, the main point here. And of course, we are saying, you know, it's not all this, this picture of the bride is not meant to be you know, something emotional where we think that, oh, you know, Jesus is like this. If I don't have anybody else, okay, only Jesus is there. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, it gives us an understanding of the way God relates with us. And um, we must also, at the same time, uh, honor human relationships, honor, uh, you know, the, the uh, institution of marriage uh, and things like that. So uh, these are some key takeaways and key points from the chapter on the bride. Uh, if you have any questions which you would like to ask right away, we can get into it quickly or we can come back and we can uh, you know, have a, a short time of discussion. So any questions for right away you can just uh, maybe you know unmute and ask. I think that will be better than typing it in the chat. So about the church being the bride. Okay, so seems like uh, everyone needs a break. So let's do that then. It's uh, 9.55. Let's come back at uh, 10.05. And uh, you know, if you have any anything to discuss, we'll take it up and then we will continue. Okay, so all right, class, let's go for a break then. Uh, we'll be back at 10.05. Thank you.